Um, yeah, I wanted to pick up on something John said to us, the panel, about it, which is um, that we're kind of the problem rather than trying to solve the problem of fake news externally um, and the critical thinking point in information literacy. Because too often when we talk about fake news, we talk about the people who consume fake news as if they're other people, mm. they're the stupid plebs. But actually, we are just as prone to with our own biases to picking this up. And I'm going to illustrate it with a very quick example because I don't want to be one of those people who monologues. Um, but I, I, Natalie follows me on social media, so she knows this. My special interest is not the Russian embassy, but it's Ed Balls. And there was an Ed Balls fake news story that started 24 hours ago that actually started because people were creating deliberate misinformation. So there's a photo of Ed Balls with two trumpets at Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's resort. And people were sharing it um, going, what's he doing there? Oh, does Yvette Cooper know? Oh, he's just like Nigel Farage, he's a fascist. But the original postings of both those photos were on Twitter and on Instagram by one of the Trumpets with a caption that made it clear that Ed Balls was filming a documentary for the BBC. And most people who shared that onto my timeline are people who consider themselves to be critical thinkers, including journalists, political activists, um, I think one of the candidates for the Green Party, people like that, were going, oh, this is terrible, it's a bad look for Ed Balls. And they didn't even take a second to Google Ed Balls Trump to see that he be, had been announced last year. Because it was a less interesting news story in October last year that was only picked up by me, um, the Radio Times, uh, the, I uh, the Irish News and one other paper, that, that he was making this documentary. Ed Balls makes a doc three-part documentary for the BBC, isn't a news story. Ed Balls looks like he's a fascist, is <laughs> I would take that first. Yeah, oh, yeah. just because that was quite a long one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then, so, uh, then keep sorry, your question sorry. short, yeah. but it was a good point. I guess I just, well, I just wanted to mention that on that uh, Penny's point about the kind of the stupidity of, of, of people, that's often it's kind of these things are very emotive. And actually, like, we've come to a point where we don't, like, I don't mean to pull off the whole kind of, we don't trust experts anymore. But the idea is that it's because we, it's very difficult, I think, for people to, they kind of vouch for the thing that feels safe or things that, 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 that they have comfort in in some ways. And I think I, I agree with you that I do worry that there is this kind of victim victimisation of people who jump on the Brexit bandwagon, who, who follow the big red bus, that kind of thing, um, because it treats them as if they haven't got these skills to figure it out. Like, obviously they have, but they don't trust who's telling them how to look at things. And I guess the, the thing we have with the museum, which we always I kind of, we, we just try to do in some ways, is we particularly with the rapid response collection, is like get people to actually ask why something is there and like get them to kind of go, oh, that's really weird. And then they realise that we've put it there for a reason. And then they ask, get them to ask questions about it. And they all have opinions. They might not agree with us. And we're very open about people tweeting when like, they, they hate things. Um, but the prob we, we have to acknowledge, particularly as I, I imagine there's lots of people in this audience who are probably quite clued up in a lot of this stuff, um, as is the case with the Echo Chamber. There's a lot of people who do share, they, they have conversations, maybe not from the same side, but about it. Um, and it's it's understanding how you introduce it to a public who wouldn't even think that like kind of how to approach this stuff. And I guess that's the kind of job of the cultural institution in some way, and 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 educators and journalists and broadcasters. Uh, I get maybe trying to figure out how you you get people to to even think or talk about that as being that, and r away from that kind of big like fake news hashtag kind of conversation. I guess this is that where that kind of misunderstanding about the audience's lives to me is like how do you even get give people those skills, I don't know, but, yeah. I had two short observations on that. One is, I think, I worry about the short memories and the complacency of audiences in the West. I think we could do with hearing stories about the Soviet bloc much more and understanding that everything mm. that's happening with fake news has happened before, and we need to stop assuming that, um, you know, somehow we're not at risk um, of, of attempts to, you know, propagandise or, or manipulate us. But the other issue is, and I see it a lot when I give talks in schools and, and to members of the public, is people can believe two contrary things at once. They can say, I don't trust mainstream media, BBC gets things wrong, newspapers get things wrong, but then they'll tell you a story that they, that, you know, and this really happened, and you go, where did you hear this story? Oh, I read it in the Mail on Sunday, or I read it, you know, on the BBC News website. And I think... There is this residual trust that a lot of people have in authority institutions, even though mm. if you ask them, they'll say they don't. And they will, maybe it goes back to this, you know, um, what do you call it, confirmation bias. They'll choose to remember the stories that they quite liked. And they'll tell you, but I read it in this paper, and therefore it's true. And I've mm. had that in the same sentence. Probably if they set foot in a newsroom, they would wonder. 
Which is why I think it's really important, and I think it's a shame the BBC, I think for security reasons, has stopped allowing tours of the BBC. But actually just taking people in physically to see, look, there are men and women here who mm. have to make editorial decisions. Mm. There's a technical process involved, and it's your institution. And it's amazing speed. I mean, I remember in the 1980s, you know, we always watched the Western television. You know, you cannot compare mm. it with, with us. Yes. And you look for the truth. But yes. it's so fast, it happens. It, ah, there is some report. And then you have to make a fast decision. Mm. Is that really... You know what we are after is it true <laughs> you know then then come all, all kinds of other editorial decisions mm. you know at the speed again you know i mean you don't have a lot of time to decide so it's not always it, it we're not criticizing human nature here. It's, it, it's, it's just a critical you know attitude you know that you have to look for those things you don't automatically filter it out because it just comes at you that news i mean it's an issue about time and just got a quick one about the like we mean john i guess as part of institutions are used to this long time approach and, and collecting things but actually what we're realizing now is with new information things that are coming up the, the, the all the research that or a lot of research in our museums might actually be wrong and it might not tell the stories and the attitudes that are there and we have the luxury of time in some ways where we have objects that are kind of 150 200 year, years old um, just sitting in our archives that actually were pillaged from things and like these are stories that we were starting to recover with research we don't have that with the news and i guess this is like, there's a really great thing that's going around, usually after terrorist attacks, by On The Media, I think it is, where it's like how to, like, wait, like, a couple of hours before you tweet something. Like, just wait and, like, wait it out and see what happens. But obviously, we are emotive beings and we react very quickly because we want to be the one who shares in a conversation mm -hmm. around it rather than being left out. But so, so I, I, want to, um, I want to bring in a couple more questions. Um, but, yeah, that, that point, we do include uh, toolkits and things like that to do with people's critical evaluation of news stories in the exhibition and... Uh, you know, that notion of who's responsible, I, th I think um, our institutions are, and, and uh, in a sense, we're all sharing this stuff. Now, our second question uh, was coming from here, and then our third from, from here, please. Uh, so the gentleman there. <coughs> Hi. Uh, I promise I'm going to try to keep this short, but it's not going to be easy, because <laughs> I had to describe. Uh, I've, most of the conversation, I think, has been focusing on the sense of fake news as something that is in a way debasing the status of journalistic truth today and are trusting it. Mm -hmm. But I think that originally the term, especially in the last 16 to 18 months, wasn't mostly referring to that. It was referring to one very specific kind of news which was really uh, building on the capacity for different agents to play or to game the incentive structure of a whole system for the attention economy, as you say, which is basically the circle by which there's 2,000 million people on Facebook, 66% uh, of them use it every day. There is a, a structure where, as you were saying, you are uh, incentivized to stay there, and we know that people react more clearly to polarized reactions, things that you really like or dislike, so you're giving more things that you like or dislike, so you're giving clickbait as a structure mm -hmm. to have polarized attentions, and then it starts the slippery slope down into a total debasement of whether you're receiving has any sort of relationship with an established channel to provide truth, or is some guys, some teenagers in Estonia in a farm pretending to be a fake website. And the problem is not really the teenagers in Estonia. The problem is Mark Zuckerberg and the whole structure who has created a massive industry by which most of the fake news are produced not really just because Putin wants to destabilize the West, but because it's a huge business. Because he denies that he's a publisher. And yeah. this, this is, I think they're at the tipping point though with, with groups like Facebook yeah. where um, they're finding it harder and harder to wriggle on this and say, yeah, we're a business and we're not, we're not an editorial publisher because they're being scuppered. And, I mean, I just would mention one news story today. You know, the um, Prime Minister has announced a unit which is going to look at fake news. Mm. No one likes the idea of the government deciding for us what is and isn't acceptable, and we, <laughs> you certainly know why. Um, but businesses like, businesses like Facebook are making it easier for governments to step in because, you know, people are seeing the impact of, of their recklessness. Twitter's another one. The abuse that goes on on Twitter... It's outrageous. They could stop it if they wanted to, and they don't. So actually, here's where my question comes, which is, uh, I think one of the reasons why this happens is because one of the most under-researched artifacts in modern life are these artifacts that they're invisible, and we don't get to see, which is the news feed and the timeline, mm -hmm. you know, which are like these massive cultural objects. Mm -hmm. Each of us have a different one. So what's your question? There I go. <laughs> my question is, no one really has any idea or any good solution right now to dismantle this whole architecture. 
Facebook is starting to say we're going to try to introduce two uh, mechanisms of moderation. So, sorry, so, we, what, so what's the question? The question is how do we dismantle this architecture of trust which is completely not working? Okay, well, if I could just give the example of Facebook, which is saying they're changing their algorithms, and I've already said that there's real questions about whether you can do it. But straight away, people have noticed stuff in their uh, Facebook feeds is different. Um, so there is an impact of a kind. I'm sure you have a view on mm. I mean, f Facebook, yeah, you, so I think Facebook is not going to stay the same as this forever. I mean, it, it might carry on for a long period of time, but I mean, f Facebook knows that it has this problem where the more friends that you have, the less likely you are to post stuff that's personal to you. And that's mm. what Facebook thrives on, is you posting that personal stuff, which is why they've changed the algorithm recently, to give more preference to, to personal family interactions. Mm. Only because it benefits people spending more time on Facebook. Not because they're remotely concerned about fake news. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, definitely, that's true. Um, so just on that point, so a platform like Facebook is a commercial platform, it's a business, um, mm. so uh, it's not the same as a newspaper, it's not subject to the same uh, rules. Yeah. Uh, I suppose um, an institution like ours, uh, historically the, the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television, more recently the National Media Museum and now the National Science and Media Museum, I don't think, to your question, we can dismantle this uh, convergence of the most sophisticated uh, technologies that have ever existed. Um, but what we can do as a museum potentially is demystify what's going on. Mm. That's, yeah. that's as far as I think we can go. Now I'm conscious of there is a third question, yeah. so let's, uh, okay. let's can, take that. Can, please. I just, yeah, John. Can, I, can I just say also that, I mean, this is perhaps very simplistic, but from our point of view as an open source organization that doesn't charge you for the content that we, that we give you, I would also say that if there is a workable open source free alternative to Facebook, there's no reason why people wouldn't use that rather than well, carrying on. Sort of I mean, yeah, just as a quick point, the problem is like that there's the idea of telling, you, you, you kind of have to do it as a mass movement. This is the problem why people, when they leave Facebook, because it's, it's, it's so tied in that sociality and that ability to talk to people that when one person leaves, it's very hard for you to bring everyone else with you because it's kind of like the kind of garden path thing. Like, if you come up with me, it'd be a slightly nicer garden. Um, but the problem is, like, I was just quickly responding to the question was, like, we don't. How? Where do we start? Like, how do you even start? Because it's black. It's a black box as it is. You can kind of see your information go in, and stuff comes out, and then you see what you see. But it's very hard for people because of how large and how um, how much it sits above territory and above government. It's very hard for you to, people. When we're not used to that structure, really. We're used to overthrowing. I think I'm not the British. We're terrible at that. Um, but overthrowing governments and the idea of overthrowing individuals. But what if it's a mass corporation like? Obviously, it's happened in historical circumstances, but it's become so tied in with things from like financial regulation and marketing and like all these things we never knew. It's like what's the Frederick Dray Jameson quote? It's like it's easier to imagine the end of world than it is to imagine the end of Facebook or capitalism. It's capitalism mm -hmm. putting Facebook in platform capitalism. But um, but yeah, it's it's a difficult thing because like where you start and I, I don't have an I don't have an answer, but, but it's the critical it, tools. But it goes back to the whole Soviet bloc. And again, I remember being told by this dissident, you know, it's all very well having online petitions. Everyone can moan all the time on social media about what they object to. But actually the days when you had to physically turn out, you had to meet people in secret, mm. um, that was how you built a revolution. And I think we have to accept that online has, has just kidded us that we're in this big community and we're changing things and all those Me Too hashtags is not how we're going to change it. It's going to be through the courts, it's going to be through real action. Although social media obviously plays a huge role in spreading awareness. Hmm. Okay, if we go to the chap here. Okay, so Owen Green from the Department of Peace Studies in University of Bradford. Uh, there's so many things to say. Thanks for the presentations. Um, in terms of responding to all of these problems, I think it becomes really important to develop our way of discussing these things so we distinguish more clearly between different categories of what we're loosely calling fake news here. An awful lot of the presentations seem to me to me more about the social shaping of news and fact and what have you. Certainly, you know, are there the proportions of contributors, where the editors come from, all of that. Every, all news and every, every social fact is constructed to some extent in terms of the appreciations that people have of it. That's really different from the deliberate instrumental manipulation of news for very specific ends. And uh, of course there are various categories that have been raised here and so mm. I'm not saying it's a bipolar, it's a question of developing a set of distinctions that's more sophisticated than that. So for example, just to you know be provocative, I would say that it is not um, the appropriate framework when you're quoting Russian embassy um, tweets 
to put that into the category of a rhetorical question, is this the sort of thing an embassy should be putting out? It's obviously just straightforward state propaganda in a very sophisticated form. It needs to be put differently to uh, intriguing use of memes and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, there's a distinction between uh, websites that just manufacturing fake news in order to get make a bit of money in Estonia uh, from very well organized political outfits that are deliberately using it to stoke particular violences. Uh, and so I'm not saying there aren't all sorts of grey areas, I'm not saying they can be categorically distinguished, but in terms of the level of tolerance of what's going on, uh, clearly it means that you know, there are different, likely to be very different social thresholds to what they're prepared to tolerate. But a great deal of the success of what is extremely successful uh, Russian propaganda over the last 10 years is not that it's not recognized as such, but it's not put in a category of its own. It's seen as outrageous as an Estonian person making up, uh, uh, making up something or something like that. It's mm. just, you know, isn't that, isn't that clever of Putin? I've been, you know, I spend a lot of time in South Asia. I can tell you there are vast numbers of people that are perfectly critical that like it because he's exposing hypocrisy. So in other words, they're linking it with a very strong narrative, which is false. But it plays into a worldview which needs to be, you know, which, uh, which is legitimate in its own right, but needs to be put in a category of its own about when you're dealing with deliberate manipulation by authoritarian regimes, but not necessarily, obviously, by presidential candidates that like to mislead <laughs> about other things. Mm -hmm. So my main point is, um, do you agree about these distinctions? And could you make, could you begin a process of... Uh, making some of those distinctions for, for the purposes of public delegitimation so that they can become more targeted and at least we can pick off some of the more obvious, uh, grotesque um, misuse of this. I mean, if I, oh, I mean, if you may, I'm just going to make, I guess, one point. Um, I think it's the idea of isolation of, of, of objects, obviously, is, is important to understand kind of precisely what it is, but I think what I'm almost more interested in is the system of objects and how they all contribute towards one another and how they... Um, like where do we get to the point where this is the thing that we ended up with? So actually, how do you track back kind of the hit like linking to things like propaganda and how it's being used kind of historically and contemporarily, and what happened for it to now be used? Well, obviously, it's always been weaponized in many ways, as you've mentioned. But it's that issue about how I, I don't think it's enough for us to we have to kind of understand how I don't know maybe from a macro level it kind of is zoomed out a bit and how do we, how do all these things work together? And that's not difficult. Sorry, not easy to, to see, obviously, and I think that's maybe where we struggle with it in terms of definition, is because there isn't these kind of clearly drawn things around them, and maybe there are in a kind of very academic sense, but outside of the academic sense, it's very difficult for, for you to kind of say there's this thing, there's this thing, and this thing, this thing, and this relates to this, and like people just see it as an overwhelming glut of stuff, and that's where I think. I guess from our institution, when, when we were researching an object, and this is a very lame comparison, but when we're researching an object, you have to think about things like provenance and where it came from and who decided it and um, and like what the story is behind that. And then obviously, but then you have to link it into a wider cultural history of this object and, and then what it meant for this particular group of people was very different to this. And, and if I, may just yeah. back, I agree with that, but that's yeah. an illustration of a big distinction. What you're trying to do is uncover a whole set of complex relationships yeah. around objects that you may display in a museum. Mm -hmm. That's really different from the deliberate manipulation by oh, no, of course, a, a think, racist group yeah. in order to develop conflict or something. But that's so I understand, that there, I understand that there yeah. are very strong um, correlations when you're trying to understand how the mm. phenomenon works. But when you're trying to fashion social responses and political responses, mm. distinctions need to be made because you're never going to get to the end of a public discourse which says, um, of course, there are many complexities, many socially embedded yeah. views in this. There are also... Um, there's, there's, there, so having accepted that, there's still a need, I think, uh, to distinguish um, between different types of instrumental use of this deliberate yeah. institutional use. Okay. I mean, this is, a, this, I think, also this is a both you. journalistic and an mm -hmm. academic thing to do. Like uh, us as Wikipedia, we can't publish anything that somebody else hasn't already written. Like there can't be an article on mm -hmm. a thing unless there's been, you know, reliable sources published on it. So. Um, that's, I mean, this, we're a bit ham hamstrung in that sense. It, there needs to be a lot of work well, to, do, to do this in this modern context. And I think there is a relationship, as you say. I mean, I think if you look at the work of someone like Carol Cadwell, who's done amazing mm. work in The Guardian, you should read it, about Cambridge Analytica and mm. the funding behind mm. Leave EU. I mean, that stuff requires mm. time and effort to read. Mm. And one of the challenges is, um, like the example I gave you of Traingate, you could watch that whole video and it took 15 minutes to watch. God knows how many days it took to piece together, to challenge one tiny bit of fake news that went viral. Um, I think you have a basic issue, which is the difference between the ease with which you know, falsehoods are generated and 
the challenge of, of trying to refute them on evidence. But I think, I think journalists have a role in, in trying to challenge some of the big ones, rather than things like some of the things Trump says or Boris says, let's build a bridge to France. Instead of that, we should be putting resources into what I think The Guardian has done very successfully mm. with their research into the bots and the attempts to manipulate elections, the connection between mm. Julian Assange, Nigel Farage mm. and on Russia. I wonder how much you think that the, sort of the demise of investigative reporting, um, with, you know, because of, partly because of di the, the pressure of digital technology on traditional media organisations, to, to what extent that's contributed to it being harder to, to do the kind of reporting that Carol Cadwalder is doing? Well, I think... People are now realising that we're risking losing a lot more than just a newspaper mm. if we don't fund it. Um, there's some interesting crowdsourced um, places. There's a, a re news website called ProPublica, which yeah, is fantastic. American, which does yeah. amazing work. You should go and look at it online. Mm. And they look at um, how stuff is working out locally. So, for example, there's a real phenomenon of black people being targeted for jaywalking mm. and giving these ridiculous fines, which means they, which they can't pay, and they end up in jail. And guess what? You can't vote if you've got a criminal record. So, mm. you know, these big pictures are all connected. Um, so that kind of journalism is happening, but I, I agree there's a real issue about monetizing it. It's the funding, um, that's essentially it. It's yeah. like it's, get, again, and it's the funding and the time that's giving people the ability and the tools to have these things, When especially when I often question the editor or the kind of the, the top level, like what is the priority for that organization to be investigating? And of course, they want to blow big stories, but, but is it because they want the quick, cheap, easy stuff to well, come click up first? Bait element click, is, yeah, of course, it's part of the problem. I think journalism, obviously, kind of mainstream series journalism, suffers as much from clickbait as, I don't know, other sort of more immediate, less uh, tangible, I don't know to say tangible, but um, like those those weird kind of like publications that exist that don't really exist. Like I think you mentioned about the kind of the those sort of fake. It looked know, like fake like, news journals. Yeah, it's like they're, but they're, they're weirdly like. I think like, there's yeah. a moment in history when all news outlets got it wrong, which was when they when news when online became a phenomenon and most of them went online for free. Um, and people thought, well, I can get it for free. And I think if everyone had said we're going to bill online and d d you know, physical sales diminish, but people would have known... I do think there's a sense of if you pay for it, you value it. Mm. And if you don't, you don't. Okay, so um, hey. I think um, <laughs> so that that horse has bolted. I think for a lot of media. Yeah, but, um, no, no, as I say, it was a moment, think, and everyone got it wrong. Um, the the uh, times. The we've we we the session here will need to wrap up on time. So it finishes at eight o'clock precisely. There's a, a, a film being screened in here uh, shortly afterwards. So we've probably got time for maybe one more question. Quick Just, fire questions. Then we can get more in. Yeah. So uh, the like chap the here. Uh, anybody. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are there any ladies? Any There's female a lady over there. Yeah, so, um, a lady? Yeah, so this lady at the back, and then we'll come to this chap here, please. No, no, thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, it's good. That's good See, to say. Oh, thank just you. While, uh, while the microphone is weaving its way up there, one of the really critical things in developing our fake news exhibition, which uh, the direction that I gave to our curators was, we're not trying to define fake news. In fact, that would be a very, very dangerous thing to do. Um, so we always, when we were working on the exhibition, always had it in speech marks as a, as a term. I, I said to them, this is as dangerous as something like asbestos or hmm. it's something we don't understand. So we need to be very cautious about it. So we asked five questions of it, but we did not, in, in our exhibition, try mm. to define it. Question. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm interested in, in access to the news, and I know that, uh, John, you, you said that um, there's only 50% of people throughout the world who even have access to the internet, and then it, it's a concern to me about the fact that newspapers are, are dying away. Um, I'd like to know what the panel would thinks about um, ordinary people's access to the news. Uh, I'm thinking about things as well like the cutbacks to libraries, to places where, again, ordinary people have access even yeah. to look at the internet. Uh, I'd like to know your views on, on that, please. Can I just on the libraries thing? There is a British librarian who goes around the world giving talks at library conferences, and he's wheeled out as a, a horror story. And librarians from all over the world gather to hear what has been done in Britain since 2010. And this could happen to you if you're not careful. I think, um, and I'll express a personal opinion here, I think there's a real concern about the impact of libraries and the disappearance of that place where you went and read the paper. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm also Thank part of my local libraries campaign in, in Lambeth, where our, our Labour Council is, is shutting down um, a lot of our libraries, um, you know, partly, well, largely because the, the the funding is being cut. So, I mean, th there are, you know, th the the interaction between how you can get more people into the libraries is something 
uh, and, and, and the problem of dropping library attendance um, partly as a result of, um, of online media, that's something I definitely think about and that's partly why we, tr we try to, um, to work with, our, uh, with partners um, to, 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 to do other things in libraries, like we work with the Scottish, li Scottish Libraries Information Council mm. um, to do Wikipedia um, editing and training in, in libraries. Um, to, the Scottish libraries also have like 3D printers in all their libraries. Mm. Um, but, you know, this stuff needs funding and if the government's not going to fund it, then uh, you know local, local councils will will make bad decisions about what they should fund because they'll have about to make the, these choices. It's about the idea of what, did, what do we mean by civic space mm, and what do we mean by civic responsibility? What's the government's role in making sure those places exist? I think it is a real concern in Britain. Um, in terms of consuming the news, um, you know, I, I mean, if I knew how to solve that one, I'd be a powerful editor, I'm sure, <laughs> instead of just a humble hack. But I do think it's important that one should seek out news while it's still there. And even if that's seeking out free online. I think it's interesting that The Guardian has a model where, like Wikipedia, they encourage donations. And who knew? But people are giving mm. significantly more than they thought. I mean, they thought, we might as well try it, why not? And um, it just shows you that I think there is, uh, for a certain proportion of the population, maybe a lot of you are in the room, um, it's that sense of they know there's something at stake and there are powerful corporate interests which are behind most of the fake news. So don't forget that. It's not thousands of individuals. There's a lot of it is corporations and governments which are hostile. Um, and we need to fight back. And there might be different ways of doing that. Just on, um, sorry. Sorry, just on the point of libraries, uh, and it just reminded me, in 2010, I worked on a project with uh, Lancaster Libraries, um, uh, basically doing an appraisal of what libraries were for. Because if we think about that time when all of these cuts were coming in, um, people were accessing media a lot more online and there was a bit of a sense, well, people don't want to borrow books. I'm not saying I, I concur with that. But if we think about what libraries actually are, they're civic spaces where people, uh, anybody essentially in the public can access knowledge. It happened when libraries were formed that that knowledge was situated within books and they were the most sophisticated technology at that time for that. And we decided that we would have public spaces to do that. The framing of libraries as places where you go and access books rather than accessing knowledge uh, is the thing that, that I think has undermined libraries and, and allowed them to be, um, yeah, uh, people destabilized. People need libraries to access the internet. The, the proportion of people who have no internet access at home mm. is huge. Yeah. But in fact, in those countries, when quite a lot of the fake news comes from, in fact, in those countries, probably most people get the information from the television. Mm. Uh, I'll give you the example mm. of Russia. Apparently, the main channel, the Channel 1, every canal, that's 90 odd percent of the people who watch that, even though something like a very high proportion of people don't believe, mm. actually, yeah. in what they hear or in television culture. But they still do that. So the television culture is there. It doesn't necessarily mean that all people well, young people certainly, but not all people get their information well, we from know the internet. We know where Donald Trump gets his information, don't we? Fox and Friends, yeah. So th there's maybe a point we haven't made here and we may not have time to make. Uh, you know, Paul sadly, Trump. even with our forum, um, the topic of Donald Trump is bigger than probably this, uh, this <laughs> humble auditorium. Um, but um, the, the point of uh, Donald Trump's use of this term fake news, I think is quite important. We haven't really talked about it. You know, Donald Trump uses this term uh, to disparage media and to Things degrade like, uh, journalists. The, 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 the similarity between what the way that Russia uses yeah. um, its sort of like information propaganda and what Donald Trump is doing I think is very important. Like there's um, one of uh, Putin's uh, famous advisors, um, Zhirkov, is credited with the sort of whole idea of um, asymmetrical warfare or non-linear mm. warfare, um, where, the, where the intention is to, is to destabilize uh, mm. what, what people's understanding is of so the truth. So easy to do. And I think, I mean, this is what Donald Trump is, uh, what the way Trump uses the term fake news, I think is a very good example of this, because he's trying to destabilize the very idea of what fake news is. Yeah. That's In why it's not propaganda, because sometimes it's, it's quite dangerous to use the term propaganda, because yeah. we always think of something mm. else. In fact, it's deception, which was a very wartime creation, and which kind of was it's normally it's done by propaganda kind of like fl organizations, flooding it was mainly by Intelligence. But it's like flooding it with as much information that it just becomes unknowable. It's that problem, like when you everything is fake news. Like, how do you begin to understand? And if that's actually how most people's interface with politics, like I don't know, if you if you are a Trump fan, that's it. It's like him with Fox and Friends. If that's where you go to get your verifiability and your and your and your news about the presidency, like if everything's fake news, it's hard for you to. But also, yeah. he keeps pumping out one thing after another, and what depresses me is how much of the mainstream American media just chases after one and they'll try and fact check something he said. Well, he's already gone on to say the next thing. Mm. This is not a smart use of resources, going back to your point about how you tackle it. You have to kind of make some choices. And one choice might be, and it's a difficult 
go and put it out there is sometimes not with Trump necessarily, but might so if you just ignore some stuff. Imagine if we didn't run a feature on Boris Johnson saying let's build a bridge to France, and we actually concentrated on some of the specific actions he has or I mean, hasn't taken. Just going back to your point about how social media can kind of pull back to news. I don't know if, you, if anyone's again, this is me sort of like, have you read the New Yorker? There's a really interesting article <laughs> about um, about uh, I think it was last week or the week before where it talks about the reciprocal kind of agreement that Fox and Friends and Trump has. Like literally, he'll tweet something and they'll pick it up and say, oh, he just tweeted this, and that will push on that conversation for the next half an hour or that reinforcement. Or so. Yeah, cycle. And like, yeah. It's a kind of. Yeah, I don't so know. I am conscious of time, folks. We've a small bit of time left. There's a very patient gentleman at the Go front on. here. That, uh, or have we covered your question? No, 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 just okay. in a way. Um, I actually think we're focusing too much on the media uh, or medium by which the information has been put out there. I think it's a very old problem. It's just that we're looking at its current context in a modern mm. format. Um, and actually, the fertile sort of um, seed, the, seed, the fertile ground that the seed is hitting, that's the issue, and the only thing you can tackle. If you go back to medieval ages, um, you had the church, uh, most mm. people were illiterate, messages were sent out by the king or the state through the churches, and everybody believed what they heard because it come from a man of the cloth as such. But did they uh, all believe what they heard? So, well, maybe, maybe not, but just in concept, you then go to like the Napoleonic War and um, uh, Bonaparte was uh, sort of uh, portrayed as a, a Corsican ogre coming to eat your children so they could drum up soldiers to come into to fight. The same thing about bringing the US into the First World War with the sinking of the liner. Mm. Uh, there's all sorts of things. As we go through the age, there's always been different means, mediums mm. of controlling people. It's created people to be, or the populace to be very cynical, not to trust power. We may have come to that sort of pinnacle where now everybody believes nothing. You know, everybody's cynical, the conspiracy theories abound. There, there, were, there were some quite nasty stuff after the Granfell Tower incident. Mm, yes. um, you know, people portraying some very extreme kind of views and, and, and some were sort of left, some were right. You know, um, it, it was irrelevant uh, what method was used. It was the fact that people believe stuff or choose not to believe stuff. And it's that, it, it's ultimately, you can't stop the media, you can't stop, it will move on from Facebook to another product if Facebook closed down. It was some other means of communication. Ultimately, it's actually how do we change people People and, and bring people to, to, to question everything like a historian does. You read one book on Bonaparte, it's pro Bonaparte. You read another book, it's anti Bonaparte. You've got two different I don't views think it's fair to, to say truth. it's about educating the public alone. I think powerful institutions mm. have a responsibility to do a good job and they need to try and engage with audiences mm. and they need to accept that they wield power. Mm. I don't think it's just. We were, just we're having a talk before this about how useful media studies was. I think yeah. we were talking about yeah. the fact that I remember when I was at you know, A level, I got told I got told to switch from a media studies because it was a useless useless AS now level. We all need media now I'm like, why is it? But yeah. I agree, it's, it's, it's not a one-tiered approach. It's and lots of things. All you can do is arm people with the, with the means to distinguish what's what's true from false. I mean, you know, luckily we're not suffering from some of the same cognitive biases that we had in the but middle ages. what is that, though? Um, what is that? I mean, although some people still are, I'm sure. Yeah, but there's a flat earth movement I think you'll find again. So. <laughs> on, the, on the flat earth movement, um, <laughs> if, um, which, uh, we, we, you know, we're a broad church here, but we are also science... <laughs> Uh, an institution concerned with science. I'm so going to say it's a fact that the Earth is not flat. <laughs> Putting it out there. I think we can finish on that because we've established <laughs> something. Um, Samira's Twitter mention is just getting mad. Oh my God, the <laughs> Russian embassy is going to be on to me. One, one more question. One yeah. Um, I just want to go back to the libraries issue, actually, because I used to work in the library service in Bradford, and. I liked what you said about libraries being um, community space, mm. social space for anybody. And I think now there's so much in the media about um, loneliness and isolation in all of the population, mm. not just elderly people. Mm. Lots of people suffer with loneliness. And don't th isn't there a statistic, something like it's almost as dangerous for your health as yeah. smoking 13 cigarettes a day? So I think it's really interesting now that the government are making a big thing about loneliness. And in actual fact, just reopening all the libraries that have shut down could do a lot to address yeah, you've that. You've made a wonderful case as well for that connection between the isolation of social media where people think they're connected. And I think it's fair to say that some of the people who spend a lot of time trolling on the internet are probably don't have that many real friends. Sorry, a bit of a guess here. Um, but I also think it's interesting that one of the phenomena of that has been people turning out for events, not just things like this but the idea of having the real experience and there's a growing experience mm. economy out there of people turning out to meet like-minded people maybe that they first met through online but whether it's going to gigs or it's going to protests like there's amazing marches yesterday um, I think we know that there isn't a substitute 
it's, the real yeah, world. Yeah, it's, mm. it's really important that we yeah. don't silo ourselves in these mm. online communities that we never get out of because that, that makes us more vulnerable to these kind of cognitive biases where you can just you know pump out a particular message to one of those communities and they'll just eat it up because they already believe that thing. It's, it's quite easy to kind of put these very technological plasters over things like that and kind of, yes, they can help unite and they can do things like kind of the, the Women's March from last year and this year. But it is that problem. I think that there is often uh, people try to kind of fix too many technological things on top of it as a, as a solution kind of go oh well if we just have this app or this thing and it's like but actually it's that's not it's the bodies in the room i guess in in kind of, so yeah. read read and um, what's his name there's a the guy who wrote um black earth um timothy snyder he's written a book on surviving tyranny and it's got 20 tips on what to do in living through this time and one of them is go and do stuff physically and meet people mm -hmm. meet like-minded people so we're really grateful i'm going to take the question if it's one quick question we've got to catch uh, we have train. To, just know uh, we want to run yeah. out not it was this, it's a statement really about again sorry about the library oh, service fine. i'm sorry about this but when I the mobile library service that went to all the disadvantaged areas in the city closed it went without a murmur it just went mm. because it was in all the disadvantaged areas so those areas of the city now for years haven't had access to a library where before they had a mobile library service but when there's talk of Ilty library possibly shutting in a very affluent middle class area of the district everybody's up in arms and does it but the important? the local housing estates working class communities haven't had a library for years and it's a disgrace yeah it is. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to have to wrap things up there. I hope that people um, found some perspectives that they maybe haven't heard before or that they thought were interesting. These guys literally do need to run for a train. Sorry. The gallery uh, will be open for a little bit, so you, you can pop in and see the exhibition if you've not had a chance to, to see it. Um, and I think we, if we could just have a, a round of applause for our panelists, please. <laughs>